Welcome to today's webinar, Local Strategies for Equitable and Sustainable Transit-Oriented Development, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Brownfields and Land Revitalization Program and Office of Community Revitalization and the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on Smart Growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. This webinar is also the fourth in a series sponsored by the US EPA's Brownfields and Land Revitalization Program and Office of Community Revitalization called Learning From and Leaning on Local Leaders to Revitalize African-American Neighborhoods. Thank you for participating today, and we encourage you to attend the other webinars in this series, as well as to watch the recordings of the past programs. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. We are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our other upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department, Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Local Strategies for Equitable and Sustainable Transit-Oriented Development. You can also search for event number 9224080. So today our panelists are Gail Lattimore, Jen Fagel, and David Queeley. Gail Lattimore has more than 30 years of nonprofit management and development experience. She has served as, as the executive director of the Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation since 1998. In this role, she is responsible for the management, growth, and health of one of Boston's largest community development corporations. During her tenure, the NDC has grown significantly, expanding its service base to meet the needs of the community and developing more than 500 units of affordable housing, both home ownership and rental. A founding board member of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, Gail continues to serve on several state, regional, and local boards dedicated to responsible community development, including the Massachusetts Association of Community Development Corporations and the Four Corners Action Coalition. Next, uh, Jen Fagel is Executive Director of the Commonwealth Kitchen, a Boston-based nonprofit food business incubator and development center. The CWK's programs include operating the Greater Boston's only shared use commercial kitchen, a wide range of business education and training programming, a separate food manufacturing social enterprise to help diverse early stage food businesses scale up, and coordinated access to a wide range of retail, wholesale, and institutional markets. Early in her career, uh, Jen spent more than 25 years as a developer of affordable housing and mission-based commercial real estate. Finally, David Queeley is a director of the Eco Innovation for the Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, where he oversees the CN, CSNDC's efforts to establish a transformative, multifaceted neighborhood scale eco district model for the Talbot Norfolk neighborhood of Dorchester, Massachusetts, the TNT Eco Innovation District, or EID, Boston's first eco district. David specializes in building vision, capacity, and resulting constituencies for sustainable cities, neighborhoods, and initiatives. He currently serves as an associate park commissioner for the city of Boston. He also served on the mayor's Go Boston 2030 task force and the mayor's zero waste task force for the city. He was also a 2014 recipient of the George 
uh, John O'Connor Award for Grassroots Leadership from Clean Water Action and a recipient of the 2016 Golden Shoe Award from Walk Boston, a statewide walking advocacy organization. Following their presentations, our panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located on the control panel on the right side of your screen. So with that out of the way, we're gonna start with a couple of quick polls as we often do for those who uh, joined us previously, and I'm sure many of you have, hopefully as part of this series. First question is, where do you live or work? And we always ask this because we have a quite a diverse audience in terms of geography. And this is information both for our panelists as well as uh, anybody interested in who's in the audience today. And we have almost 600 people here right now, so it's always interesting to see where people are from. So we'll leave this open for a few more seconds. If you are having trouble responding to it, you may need to exit from full screen mode. And we'll give you a couple more seconds to respond. And it looks like it's uh, quite distributed today. So 32% of our audience said they're in the Mid-Atlantic or Northeast, 22% in the West, 21% in the South, 19% in the Midwest, and 7% of the audience today is international. Okay, one other quick question for you all. It's relevant to the panel here. Pre-pandemic, how did you typically spend most of your commute to work? And you can select one of these, driving, bus, train or subway, walking, biking, or other. So we'll give you a few seconds to respond to that. And then we'll move into the next part. Our presentation, again, thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to not only share uh, what we're going to hear today, but I've been a great uh, series on this topic, generally speaking, with our colleagues at EPA. A couple more seconds here, and we'll share what everybody said. Okay, and so 62% uh, of our audience drive. 15% walk or bike, 9% both use the bus or train and subway, and 5% other. Okay, with that, I'm going to say that today's session will be introduced by Vicky Arroyo, who is the Associate Administrator for Policy at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. In this role, she oversees a diverse portfolio at the agency that includes regulatory policy and management, environmental justice, climate adaptation, environmental economics, community revitalization, NEPA, and more. For 12 years prior, Vicki served as the executive director of the Georgetown Climate Center, where she was also a professor at Georgetown Law. Vicki oversaw the Georgetown Climate Center's work at the nexus of climate and energy policy. She supervised the staff and student work on climate mitigation and adaptation at the city, state, and federal level. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vicki, and you can see her now. Hi, thank you so much, Michael. It's really a pleasure to join you all. I, as you heard, I'm Vicki Royo, Associate Administrator of EPA, and I'm really delighted to provide this introduction for this webinar. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity to work with communities to provide transportation options, such as transit and safer walking and biking paths that connect people to each other, to schools, to workplaces and economic opportunities and more. And I relied on all of those options as somebody who didn't have my own car and didn't drive when I lived and worked and went to grad school in the Boston area many years ago, taking transit to my job as an open space planner in Braintree and biking to school. So very much appreciate all these opportunities to talk about alternatives to conventional driving. And of course, where we live and work can influence our health, our economic potential, and our children's futures. Everyone in America, no matter their age or their ability, their income or race deserves the option to live somewhere affordable and convenient and safe. Addressing disparities in underserved communities and promoting environmental justice are major priorities of the Biden administration and for EPA. And a key approach to these priorities is investing in and supporting underserved communities, working to make neighborhoods cleaner and healthier and better places to live. Since its inception, EPA's Brownfields program has provided nearly $1.8 billion in grants to help communities return once contaminated sites to productive use. Some of that funding was invested in neighborhoods and near the transit stations that you'll be hearing about today. And I'm grateful to President Biden and to EPA Administrator Regan for recognizing the importance of this program and supporting EJ communities that have lived 
near and with blighted properties for so long. This story is also about the value of smart growth approaches championed by EPA's Office of Community Revitalization, which is you know, located in the Office of Policy that I lead, and the Smart Growth Network, creating walkable communities with a strong public transit choice is a key tool for addressing climate change with local action, but it's about a lot more than climate as well. The federal government can and should help support communities across the board that address climate change, resilience, health, and equity disparities. There are multiple benefits from investing in community sustainability and resilience, things like providing opportunities for improved physical and mental health and the physical exercise of getting out, um, air quality issues, um, and, and more. As documented by the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Bringing federal assistance to community-driven efforts should also be about working with the community, not just in the community. EPA's work with communities is most effective when we recognize and build on existing assets, such as the untapped potential in underrepresented residents, historic architecture and local landmarks, unique small businesses, and talented local entrepreneurs. It's important to learn from the past that we can do even better in this work moving forward. Today's webinar will tell the story of one of our past efforts in Boston, a partnership that came together both at the local level with the Fairmont Indigo Collaborative and also with federal partners as well, EPA, HUD, and DOT. And these two partnerships work together to promote greater transit equity, affordable housing, economic opportunity, and access to healthy green spaces. While great strides have been made, this work continues today with the predominantly minority and immigrant neighborhoods of Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan, and High Park. And through my own work over the years, both at the local level, um, as I mentioned before, starting out in Braintree when I was a graduate student, um, state work in my home state of Louisiana, and with the group that I led at Georgetown that worked with states, including Massachusetts and New England and the Mid-Atlantic states and the Transportation and Climate Initiative, and now at the federal level, I've seen some of the challenges involved with providing more transportation choice, while also maintaining housing and economic options for community members, challenges that communities like Fairmont Quarter face. We can learn so much from what these communities have achieved and what they're still striving for. And that's why webinars like this are so important. So I hope that as you listen and participate today, you'll think about what positive le lessons we can take from the hard work associated with these experiences, what has worked and what can we do differently and better, and to also think creatively about how we can begin new projects and new stories of cleanup and transit equity and community revitalization and how we can best serve the residents of these communities going forward. We have a great opportunity to channel some new funding that we hope to see coming across from the Hill to improve the quality of life and health for residents of many communities. And we all need to do our part to work with community-driven efforts and address significant racial disparities in our society. So thank you so much for joining us and for the opportunity for me to kick this off by saying a few words. And I'm now gonna pass it off to Jessica Dominguez from EPA's Region 1's Land Revitalization Office as their coordinator to provide some further context for today's panel. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Vicki, and thank you for everyone uh, for joining us today. As Vicki said, I'm Jessica Dominguez, and I'm the Land Revitalization Coordinator in APA Region 1. Um, I started working, and I had to do the math when preparing for this panel, uh, back in October of 2009 with folks in the Fairmont Indigo Corridor, and it's really um, been a compelling and inspiring journey since. Um, and I really wanted just to take a brief moment uh, just to provide some context of some of the federal investments that have supported um, the local community goals um, that we'll be learning more about today. Um, fortunately for me and all of you, there's a video uh, that can do it a lot more effectively uh, than I would relate in the moment. Um, so this, the video that we're about to see was produced by the EPA. Um, it provides some great context to a moment in time of a federal partnership that was able to come in and partner with the local partnership on the ground level and really meet some of the needs they had at that time. But again, it's just the tip of the iceberg of some continuing uh, investments on, on the federal, state, and local level um, that's really helping move things along um, in these neighborhoods. So with that, I'm cue the video.
things are. It was getting people out of the cars. They want that onto the trains, but they also are concerned about safety. Thank you, Jessica, and hopefully everybody saw that. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gail Lattimore to begin our panel presentations. Welcome to Gail. Hello, everyone. I'm Gail Lattimore, Executive Director of the Cotman Square Neighbor Development Corporation, and I'm really pleased to be here. I want to uh, thank the EPA for inviting me to speak about the Fairmount CDC Collaborative. Um, this, the EPA has been extremely supportive of our work uh, over the last 17 or so years that we've been in collaboration with uh, three other, originally three other CDCs and now two uh, community development corporations. So there are a total of three of us that have been together and the EPA has been a tremendous supporter um, from the perspective of providing capital, brownfields, remediation money for the transit-oriented developments that we've done. They've also provided uh, grants, um, some Soak Up the Sun grants uh, for uh, some of the uh, work that uh, we've done around uh, the, the planting uh, of green bus stop roofs, and Dave Quealy of Cotton Square will speak later about some of that. And also, they provided just a lot of psychic support to us and um, cheer-led cheer -led us along the way and encouraged us to continue to do the work. So hopefully you can see my screen. I'm not the best at uh, these uh, you know, technology issues, but I hope you can see my screen. And I'll start. Um, You're good to go, Gail. Great. Thank you. Start talking about the work that we've done. So the Fairmount CDC Collaborative's goals are to basically strengthen uh, the diverse communities that are lining the Fairmount commuter rail line, which is a nine mile commuter rail line that essentially uh, had, up until we uh, did the advocacy, had bypassed our inner city neighborhoods of uh, Dorchester, Hyde Park, and Mattapan. And so we're trying to make these, uh, the the rail line um, and these neighborhoods, places of opportunity for the low and moderate income, primarily BIPOC community that lives in them. So that's our goals. We had three key goals originally and have added a number of additional goals over time. So the first goal was transit equity. We wanted to get um, at least uh, three, uh, if not four new stops on the line to, uh, in our service areas. We had a goal of trying to develop transit-oriented uh, housing, affordable housing, and hopefully without displacing the low and moderate income people. So the idea was to develop these little urban villages within a half mile radius of each of the existing or proposed stops uh, with affordable housing up above and ground floor commercial space to revitalize our communities within a half mile radius of each of those proposed and existing stops. We also had the goal of developing a greenway along the line to actually create passive recreational spaces and green opportunities for residents in our community. Uh, those were our top three goals when we started back in 2004 or so. And subsequently, we have um, developed additional uh, goals of economic opportunity, trying to do job development, 
and some climate and sustainability work as well. So those were our goals. So the Fairmount commuter rail line, as I said, is a nine mile commuter rail line that starts uh, in the Hyde Park section of, uh, well, it actually starts downtown um, at South Station in the heart of uh, downtown and tr goes all the way out to the uh, more suburban type area of Boston. It's a rail line that is solely based in um, Boston, one of the, the, the Mass Bay Transportation Authority's only solely Boston-based commuter rail line. And as you can see from this map, uh, there, this was this is essentially Cobman Square's area, uh, service area that I'm highlighting with this with my cursor right now, which is uh, South Dorchester, about uh, three square mile service area with about 50,000 people, predominantly low mod income people of color. And up until we advocated for and got the Fairmount line, uh, we call it the Fairmount Indigo line because we're trying to put a color to it so that it can become a rapid transit line that the other lines are called the red line, the yellow line. So we call it the Fairmount Indigo line. Up until we advocated for the additional stops, we had very little transit, rapid or let's put it this way, train service in our neighborhoods. The red line uh, did uh, serve a portion of our service area, but it literally took folks and, and about 40 or so percent, as you heard in the, uh, in the video, percent of our residents work downtown. So it literally took folks like up to an hour in our service area to get downtown, as opposed to having this uh, Indigo, Fairmount Indigo line where they could get downtown in about 15 minutes. So it's a nine mile rail, um, uh, rail line, commuter rail line that um, we were fighting for transit equity and transit justice for. And there was already a group that had started doing the work that caught, uh, to get the lines funding for the line um, but uh, Codman joined forces with that group and as well as the other CDCs to really put more pressure on the state to get that line going. So as I said, it's a nine and mile uh, rail line. There are about 93,000 people who live uh, within a half mile radius of that uh, rail line in the four different neighborhoods that the uh, three CDCs uh, serve, Roxbury, Dor well, Dorchester, uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and Hyde Park. 61% of the, and these stats are from 2016. I didn't get a chance to update them, but I think that they've only gotten uh, some of them worse um, as time has gone along with the pandemic, but 61% people of color, about 20% people uh, who speak Spanish as a first uh, language, 40% of our households earning less than 40,000, uh, a significant uh, poverty rate as well. And, uh, and at that time, the unemployment in our service areas was uh, at least 25% higher than in other, other areas. Um, and then the median home prices for um, the area were significantly higher as well uh, than other areas of the um, of other areas of Boston. And so those are some of the statistics for our, the Fairmount Corridor. Some of the impacts that we've had, and I'll then get into some details of, of where we, how we've in, impacted each of these various areas that we focused on, have included about 4,000 residents being um, housed since we started this work, about 1,000 units being developed and about 4,000 uh, residents being housed. 3,000 residents engaged in the political and other advocacy that was required to get the rail line into our service area, and uh, over $4 million in public and private investment, which included uh, $200 million invested in the rail line itself to uh, bring those uh, four stops, four new stops on the, onto the line and to upgrade the um, existing stops on the line. And we also have created many partnerships, about 30, at least 30 or so different members and agencies involved in our work. And then in terms of the, um, the ridership on the Fairmount line, as the new stops came in, the ridership has um, more than tripled uh, since uh, the line started. And I just found out today over the 17 years of our collaboration, but I just found out today that even during the pandemic, the, our, the Fairmount commuter rail line, although the numbers have dipped as they have for a lot of um, public transit, 
we are still the uh, highest. We have the we had the highest ridership during the pandemic of any of the commuter rail lines, and that's indicative of the fact that we have a community that relies heavily, working class community that relies heavily on public transportation. And so we've had many other impacts from our work. Um, you know, increased political clout. We've been able to uh, flex our organizing muscles and organizing our community to push for the 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 needs that they had around the transit and the transit oriented development. And we've been able to increase our skills and increase our collaboration and work uh, more closely with a range of different partners at both the state and other levels. And this is just a list of some of the partners, local partners that we've worked with. There's a range of both academic, um, you know, uh, job cre creation and, and job search and placement agencies, open space and uh, you know smart growth type agencies that we've been involved in and a range of funders as well that have supported our work including the EPA. On the transit equity side I'm going to talk a little bit about some of uh, what we've been able to achieve there. Again there are about 200 million dollars uh, that has been invested in state funds to open four new stops. Two of those stops uh, were opened in Codman's own service area. So where we never had service on this line, we now have service uh, as of 2012. The first stop was open. The last stop was open just a little under two years ago in the Mattapan area. We also have fought for transit equity. And so working with the community and organizing the community to uh, you know, rally and, and meet with legislators and policymakers, we've been able to reduce fares on the Fairmount line so that they are equal to subway level fares because they had been uh, at the rate about $4.25 one way. And for folks who are earning $30,000 a year uh, to pay uh, $8.50 for a round trip downtown just did not work out. So we advocated and the MBTA did about four or five years ago did initiate a um, pilot fare uh, reduction. Uh, so now, and now it's permanent. So now folks can get on for $2.40, the same as Subway. We're still fighting for one of the stations at the end of the line in Reedville, in, in the Hyde Park section of, of uh, Boston to get its rates down because it's in a different zone than, than the rest of the, uh, the, um, the line. But again, there's been a 300% uh, increase in ridership, even though it's uh, reduced slightly. On the transit oriented development side, we've uh, developed, as I said, about 1,000 units of affordable housing that had a, had, is housing close to 4,000 people. And um, all of this housing is in walking distance to the station. Uh, we have been uh, working to uh, make sure that that housing is as green and energy as efficient as possible. All of the housing has been designed to at least lead standards. And uh, one of our more recent projects and all of our projects subsequently have been designed to meet or exceed at least lead silver standards, silver standards. So, and Codman itself has at least another 150 units of um, affordable housing in its pipeline. And our other two uh, community development peers, which are Dorchester Bay Economic Development, Corporation, which serves North Dorchester and uh, the Southwest Boston Community Development Corporation, which serves Hyde Park. They also have a hefty pipeline of projects as well. These are just some of the projects that uh, want to give you a sense of the type of housing that we've been doing. All of these uh, are from a previous presentation a couple of years ago, but all the housing that, you, that you'll see, pretty much all of it has been completed by now. So there's 44 units that Codman developed. The Indigo block, about 88 units, uh, was recently just completed by Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corp, one of the other CDCs in the collaborative. And the residences at Fairmount was completed about, uh, oh, at least two years ago, roughly. And that's 24, 27 units of affordable housing. And all of this is right within walking distance of the line. You know, one of the things that we were really concerned about early on was the idea of as these transit stops that we were fighting for were installed in the community, what would be the impact of that on the low-moderate income residents that we were concerned about? 
we knew from our research that uh, one of the one of the leading triggers for gentrification and displacement is increased transit. And so uh, it's amazing that how fast it has happened in our community. We are definitely seeing in, uh, gentrification and displacement happening as um, more folks find our, our community an attractive place to, to live because it is relatively more affordable from, an affo from a housing perspective and folks who are higher income are getting priced out of some of the uh, other neighborhoods of Boston that surround Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan. And then to add to that, we've got the increased transit and other amenities uh, like some nice parks, et cetera. So no surprise, but it was surprising to some extent how fast we've seen the gentrification and displacement happening. And we've organized residents to kind of, you know, fight to kind of stabilize uh, affordable, uh, the neighborhood for affordability. We've organized residents around legislation uh, to, you know, uh, to get just cause eviction. Unfortunately, we did not win that one, but we did win a Community Preservation Act, which is a slight increase in the uh, real estate taxes for uh, residents. And half of that money goes into um, affordable housing. We also right now are working with residents to advocate for with the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, where tenants get first right of refusal when their um, multifamily properties are up for sale. So many residents involved and many other um, you know, advocacy efforts going on. On the economic development front, these are the things that we've kind of morphed into. We started off with those three challenges of afford uh, transit equity. Uh, transit-oriented development and developing a greenway along the Fairmount line, but we've kind of morphed into additional economic opportunities along the line. And so uh, we started uh, a job referral network, and uh, that led to several hundred jobs that we placed folks into jobs and training that we placed folks into a few years back. Just by virtue of doing the affordable housing work that we do, uh, over a thousand jobs uh, were created uh, through the construction. And I know uh, of those uh, of those uh, affordable housing developments, and I know that Jen Fagel will talk a little bit more about the Born and Pearlstein um, Food Production Center and the jobs there. We've also developed uh, over 100,000 square feet of uh, new transit-oriented development commercial space where we are trying our best to make that space as affordable to low moderate income uh, excuse me, um, businesses, uh, small businesses, particularly um, MBE businesses. And we do offer quite a bit of small business technical assistance uh, and, and lending through our efforts. And we also do quite a bit of, you know, at, have morphed into doing quite a bit as a collective of foreclosure prevention and re resident financial capacity work, uh, financial literacy, uh, where we've uh, created you know, hundreds of first-time home buyers over the years. And on the Fairmount Greenway side, we have um, developed, we have worked with the city to uh, preserve certain open space that is along the Fairmount commuter rail line for, for, for open space, for green activities, for um, passive recreational, or, or, or in, in the case of this middle, bottom middle slide, to actually uh, do an urban agriculture site that Cobbett Square uh, has cultivated uh, with using, uh, working with men of color to gain skills in the urban agriculture field. Uh, and we have cultivated that site for over seven years now and produce about 3,000 pounds of produce every year out of that site that we distribute low at low or no cost to the community, helping to kind of take care of urban um, of, of, of kind of food deserts, deserts that exist in our community uh, where, where we need uh, fresh produce. This uh, a little photo down to the um, left, the right hand corner of the uh, bottom is uh, the goats that Southwest Boston CDC and Hyde Park actually uh, had uh, taken, uh, had, had youth working to do environmental cleanup of a urban wild site and they actually bought goats in in conjunction with a, a partner to literally eat all of the vegetation that was clogging up the site. So there's a range of 
urban gardens and other things. We do all kinds of biking activities that, you know, also this greenway is more is all, is just as much about paths along and adjacent to the Fairmount line that go into the neighborhood, kind of connecting, you know, the bike paths and other things to to the um, into the community from the line. And we did this in conjunction with uh, residents, about 700 people engaged in identifying the open spaces and working with a landscape and uh, urban planning uh, firm that created an actual greenway plan that is producing all these, these things that I talked about in terms of bike paths, open space, et cetera. On the sustainability front, we have um, you know, been increasingly looking at uh, the work, uh, the, the fact that our, and Dave, I'm sure we'll speak more about this, so I won't get into too much detail, the fact that our communities are, you know, we have a lot of environmental justice issues in our community. We have urban heat island effect in our community. We're the hottest community in the, one of the hottest communities in the city of Boston in terms of heat island effect. We have, you know, highest rates of asthma, uh, et cetera. So we have increasingly gotten into looking at how we can address those issues, working with residents. And this is a picture of uh, the youth uh, in, I, I think it's the youth in the Talbot Norfolk Triangle area, uh, Eco Innovation District that are putting green um, bus stop, putting green roofs on the bus stops in the Fairmount corridor. It's an example of the kind of work we're doing in the sustainability space. And so again, Dave will talk about the transit, the, excuse me, the Talbot Norfolk Triangle Eco Innovation District work we have all, I'm sure he'll also talk about the green infrastructure training and certification work. We now um, have uh, morphed into providing uh, a, a national training to low moderate income people in our community so that they can get certified in green infrastructure and with the many opportunities that exist at the public level and other levels with, um, for um, capital projects uh, that relate to uh, cooling and greening the, the community. And uh, so, let's see, I think I'll just talk a little bit, about, uh, show a little bit about some of the residents that have uh, moved into our property. This is the Levado building that uh, right across the street, literally from that building is the relatively new stop on the Fairmount line, the Talbot Ave stop on the Fairmount line that was installed in 2012. And this is just an example of, you know, the residents that live in the property and what they feel and how, and ha and how they, speak about, you know, both living in the property as well as the Fairmount line. And we, uh, Southwest Boston CDC also has been very involved in organizing residents to, you know, develop, further develop the community. And this is just an example of one of the residents in what they call the power group, people of Hyde Park wanting equal representation, have fought to actually develop a, um, a green space that you would never know was a park because it's it was in very you know bad shape, dilapidated with you know asphalt and many pieces right along the Neponset River, which also runs through uh, uh, certain parts of of our Fairmount corridor. They were involved in fighting to get that uh, really turned into a park and getting state resources to do that. So this is an example of the kind of voice, the resident voice and the leadership development that we've been about consistently in the Fairmount line. And on the horizon, just a, one or a couple of few slides and then I'm done is, you know, um, we have had many opportunities to do uh, kind of job creation right now, the green uh, infrastructure training and certification effort is one that is um, very much um, top of mind and, and a high priority for Codman. Um, but there also was a report that was done by the American Cities Collaborative and the Local Initiative Support Corporation. This is going back probably about five or, five or so years ago, but a report that really highlighted the potential for business development along the Fairmount Corridor and also pointed out that the Fairmount Corridor could be considered what's what we call in Massachusetts a gateway community, which means that it had many immigrants, many people of color, low moderate income, a lot of folks don't look at Boston as, you know, that type of community, but within that corridor, the Fairmount Corridor, it certainly has those kind of characteristics. Other opportunities that um, the Community Preservation Act, we had the victory of winning that city legislation to increase slightly the real estate taxes to get half of the, uh, I want to say it was, 
about $100 million in new money for affordable housing development. That is much of which is going toward the Fairmount CDC work, uh, TOD work, and just a range of other opportunities on the housing side. On the transit equity side, um, we had really been working for at least the last four years to try to get the Charlie card reader the, the, at the Fairmount stations. And finally, just recently won that. And what that means is people can now use their Charlie cards to pay for the fare on, uh, and, uh, on the line and also get free transfers to other um, uh, lines and buses once they, once they uh, get to their, to their destination, either downtown or otherwise. And the Fairmount line was also subject to the subject of the Boston 2020 planning process. So there was a significant emphasis in the city of Boston to planning uh, uh, and uh, along the Fairmount line. And we were involved in, in some of that. On the Greenway side, we've, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we've been doing quite a bit of climate justice uh, work. We got a, a, Kresge, a grant from Kresge Foundation and we have local uh, community residents now involved, including a person of people of color, uh, BIPOC um, climate justice group that's involved in putting together a range of projects and pushing to um, that like open space, green canopy tree projects uh, and urban uh, agriculture projects. And they're also pushing for climate legislation in the state. And we, we recently won, um, you know, won a, a big piece of legislation at the state level that is bringing quite a bit of resources and changing the, 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 the landscape in terms of climate issues in the community, including uh, $12 million that we are advocating for, getting $12 million from that legislation to further green job development in our service area. And then we also have activated the green spaces that I mentioned when I talked about the Fairmount Greenway. And there are still some, some challenges. You know, there's the issues that we that have been laid bare uh, of structural and institutional racism that have been laid bare over the last year in particular. Uh, the impacts of COVID, you know, we've seen that COVID has had a disproportionate impact on our community in terms of their health, financial and, and, and physical health. Um, and also, you know, contributed to what was already an income inequality that existed in our community. And uh, so we are, we have no um, shortage of challenges. You know, these, this is just a list of them. I won't go into all of them. And we continue to try to work on as many of them as possible. So that's, you know, an overview of what we've been about. And um, uh, I think we're going to hold on questions until the end, so I will turn it over to now to Jen Fagel, who's going to talk about the work that she's been doing. Thank you, Gail. Everybody got me? Yeah, looks like it. Um, it's such so interesting just to think, Gail, back on where we were and how impressive the amount of work that's got that's been done over the last decade plus, so congrats to you and everybody for the tremendous work you've been doing at, a, at, the, at the higher level. My, my, my talk is gonna be a more specific to one project that we did uh, with our organization, Commonwealth Kitchen, with one of the key partners, Dorchester Bay Economic Development, um, along the corridor to think about how we do economic development, um, and in our case, in the food industry, related to the larger uh, work that the Fairmont Coalition is trying to do. So Commonwealth Kitchen, we are a food business incubator development center. We are specifically focused on racial, social, and economic justice within the food economy. Um, some people think we're a food justice organization. We are not, or a, or a healthy food organization. We are not. There's way more fried food than I've ever eaten in my life since I've worked here, and it's delicious, but it is not healthy. Um, but I want to, oops, let me, not, my slides aren't moving. Maybe somebody can help me understand. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, so the building that we are in, which is along the Fairmount Corridor, um, is a former Pearl, a former Pearl Meats factory. So this was an old hot dog and corned beef factory um, in a very dense residential low-income neighborhood. It's a two-acre site. The building itself is about 36,000 square feet. So this is no small building. Um, and a bit of an eyesore on the neighborhood. When, when Dorchester Bay Economic Development purchased the building, their plan 
as a lot of the CDCs are, was to tear down and make more housing because there was a huge need for housing in the, in the city. Um, but what the community said is we don't need more affordable housing in this neighborhood. What we need is jobs. And so what can we do to bring jobs back into the city? And so I was asked to try to help think about, well, what would you do with this absurd location in this dense neighborhood where um, uh, uh, access to transit is coming, but not really here yet? Um, and it was at a time in 2011 or so when um, the real estate market was in <laughs> rough shape. And so thinking about a commercial site and how you're going to attract a business to come into this location was going to be a real challenge. And so we started looking around at what were some opportunities specific to, to from the economic development side and had the incredible luck and moment that the city of Boston with Dorchester Bay applied and received a HUD choice neighborhoods grant. So there was a $21 million commitment that came into this area that you see on this map in blue, the Quincy Corridor planning area. And our building, the Pearl Meets building, is literally straight in the middle of the, the sea in the Quincy Corridor. So, and this building sits abuts a bunch of the housing that was going to be redeveloped as part of the Choice Neighborhoods Grant. And, and as most of you on this call probably know, HUD Choice Neighborhood requires that there you integrate housing, economic development, neighborhood improvement, um, uh, community building into the redevelopment strategy. And so there was a requirement that there be some economic development uh, plan. And here was Dorchester Bay owning this two acre site. At the same time in 2012, you heard a little bit about this from Gail, that there was a lot going on in the city of Boston around things like changing zoning to allow urban ag in the city, bringing more farmers markets into the city. Food trucks were becoming really hot here in Boston at that time. And at the same time, at the federal level, um, the Health and Human Services had launched the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. And there was just an opportunity potentially to think about food as one of the things we could do in this building that was a meat plant. And the other uh, important piece from a real estate side of this is if you looked around at what was happening in the commercial real estate market, especially light industrial in the city of Boston, and, and this is true in most major cities around the country, the smaller the square footage of, of, of industrial real estate, the less likely it is that it's available. And this is a factor because big developers and big property owners, they don't want to create three, four, five, 10,000 square foot spaces. That's too much money for them to want to invest in. They want to have a you know, 10 or 20 or 30,000 square foot space. They get at least a one tenant. They don't do the fit out. And so what we found as we were trying to research what were the opportunities was that if we could take this building and create spaces for smaller light industrial manufacturing, initially thinking about contractors, artists, um, in addition to food, there was an interesting opportunity. Um, and ultimately, because of all these things you see about what was going on in the city from a financing perspective, we ended up landing on food. Um, this is a floor plan of the building. What's important to see about this building is just that it's this absurd warren of spaces. And so lots of little bit, bitty spaces that from a structural standpoint would be very expensive and difficult to kind of redevelop and, 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 and tear out and start again. And this was a building that some people would say, well, why didn't you just tear down and start all over again? But the challenge was from a financing perspective, how do you finance any concept that is an idea and not necessarily based on an existing business with existing financials? And so we were stuck looking at all of this and saying, okay, how do we take this, this monster of a building and find a way to actually make it bring jobs back to the neighborhood, small business into the neighborhood? Could businesses be a way to actually think about economic opportunity and mobility? We thought about in the food industry, food jobs are, they're very accessible, uh, non-native English speaker, um, criminal record, whatever it might be, there's a lot of opportunity into this field. And while it is known for not great wages at the beginning, there are tremendous opportunities for where you can go, especially pre-COVID. COVID has changed a lot of that. But also we all know that, that in many ways the biggest power uh, and opportunity in economic development is in the business side. And so we really thought about this site as what could you do to create opportunities for women, immigrants, people of color to start businesses through those businesses, let them create jobs because who are they going to hire? They're going to hire friends, family, neighbors, and people coming from, from the local community. 
And so we spent time thinking through like how do we make that make make this building turn into this small business food business development center with in this case Commonwealth Kitchen as the anchor as a food business development organization and then bringing in other companies food trucks caterers etc to be part of it um, and honestly when you look at this building and you see it it's a refrigerator with loading docks it actually makes a ton of sense and you can see here and I can talk about it in our in the in the questions of what the financing was but new market tax credits HUD choice and the thing I want to say from the perspective of, of where the government fit into this is that the, the HUD Choice Neighborhoods Grant and EPA Brownfields Grants were some of the very first money in on this project. As a $15 million project, that money came in at less than a million dollars. So it was not the thing that made this project go. However, the combination of these two federal agencies saying we are in was the thing that then got everybody else, the city, the state, the new markets providers, everybody else to say, this is a deal that, that others are excited about. We need to find a way to support them. Um, and so I can't say enough about the importance of those res allocation of resources early on and how we were able to then develop the project. So, you know, a couple years later, here's what we've transformed this building into. It is now home to our own organization, which has about 50 businesses. I'll talk about that in a minute. But another uh, five companies and combined with the entire building, which was vacant for almost 15 years, now employs, again, pre-COVID, challenging today, but employs over 200 people working here every day. Probably 60% of those people walk to work. So taking this building and bringing this kind of a, of a manufacturing facility into the neighborhood might seem counterintuitive, but in fact, there's a lot of benefits that it had from uh, what it meant for the people in this neighborhood um, and people hiring friends and family and people look like them. So, and, and I found this as I was thinking about this today and just remarking on where we've been and this time when our, our mayor, uh, Marty Walsh, was he was the mayor and now he's our secretary of labor, just how these things come back around. And, it's just nice to kind of reflect on on where where the government piece has been a really key and strategic part in what we're doing. So so what is Commonwealth Kitchen? So what is it we as an organization are actually doing? So so Commonwealth Kitchen, you probably have heard about these ideas of shared kitchens. You think about in the food industry, the biggest challenge to starting a food company is the cost of the kitchen. And our theory was if we could create a shared kitchen like a gym membership for food businesses where all the equipment is there and people can come in and rent it by the hour, we could lower that barrier to entry. We could help a lot of people start early, try hard. If they fail, they fail. They don't lose their shirt, but they can actually work to try to build successful companies. And so that's where we started with the organization. Today, on average, we have about 50 businesses that work in our kitchens. So that's insanity. Uh, food trucks, caterers, bakers, all kinds of companies. Um, we have a mission as a, to, around economic opportunity and racial justice. So we work really hard to ensure that at least 75% of the businesses that, that are in our kitchens are owned by people of color. Um, and we work with our businesses to uh, find employees for them by working with a lot of the job training organizations in the neighborhood. So that as much as we can, the jobs and the business opportunities are going to folks from the Fairmount Corridor. Um, and including our own um, marketing and outreach always starts with business with individuals who are residents of the corridor. But we know that having a, having a great recipe and access to a kitchen isn't enough. That in the food industry, understanding permit, food safety, licensing, you know, what you're allowed to put on a label if you're a product company, how, where to sell if you're a food truck, how to get your menu right if you're doing catering. There's so much to it. And so we understood that we were going to need to do a lot more education if we were going to be successful in building real businesses. So today we provide a tremendous amount of education and training through workshops, one-on-ones. We have a partnership with Babson College where we provide a, a, a business class for existing companies as they're continuing to scale, really trying to make sure we're meeting businesses where they are and thinking about the issues for a business owner around human social financial capital. If they don't have access to all three, they are not gonna be a successful business. The other piece that we have seen as we've been open is that 
as our companies, particularly the product companies, start to scale. So think about a salsa company. And that business owner starts making that salsa themselves. They work in that shared kitchen. They may be only making that product one day a week, twice, two days a month, and then they're spending the rest of their time out selling it. So those days they're making the product, how do they find staff to help them? This is a terrible job. Like it's inconsistent. What are they doing? Those business owners may or may not be really good at managing staff. Um, and what we kept seeing was businesses get stuck making it themselves, working as artisans, and not being big enough either to start to automate in their own facility or go to something called a co-packer, which is a third party that would typically you would use to make their food. And so we had this theory, well, what if we could take over that production from our businesses? What if we took that salsa, we made that on Mondays, we used the same staff to make pickles on Tuesday and tomato sauce on Wednesdays, and could we find a way to help our companies as they're scaling, them get out of the kitchen, hand production to us, aggregate lots of pretty lousy part-time jo jobs into full-time jobs with benefits training on our staff and help those businesses grow. And so we started doing that a few years ago. We now work with about a dozen of our businesses and I can say more about what, how incredibly important this has been to our work and to our businesses, but I will say that this piece around small batch manufacturing is a gap uh, across the United States in the industry in a place where it's very hard to do, but when done well, can, can open up a tremendous number of doors. And for us as a nonprofit also means it can bring in some revenue because we charge for our services, a very low fee to our business owners, but we also work with restaurants, with farms, with colleges and hospitals. And so that, that allows us to, to be uh, very nimble and entrepreneurial in the work we do. The other piece that we do is we really want to think about for our business owners, how do they access markets? So again, think about who our business owners are. Somebody, th this picture uh, from the Boston Globe, this is uh, a company, Happy African Gourmet. She makes products that are unfamiliar to an awful lot of people in the United States. They are incredibly delicious, her peanut sauce, her other things she's doing. How do we help her find markets and opportunity when she doesn't have access to capital, friends and family money, resources, and she has a product that's unfamiliar to a broad audience? So for us, that meant really trying to think about forging strategic partnerships. Could we have a relationship with Whole Foods to help get her onto the shelves at Whole Foods? But also, could we help get her onto the menu at Harvard or MIT? Um, could we take, in, in the case of what you see on the right-hand side of this, the launch pad, could we actually go and work with um, MIT, which we are now doing, where we actually took over their entire food court in the student center, and we have put three of our business owners of color working in the food court where students can use their dining cards to buy meals from our businesses. So you can see what we're doing. We're bringing companies in, we're helping them get set up, we're helping them scale, and then we're helping them access the right markets at the right time to become real companies. This for us is what it means to do real economic development and economic mobility. So when you think about where we've been in the last however many years, seven years it's been now, we now have 65 alumni companies that are still in business. Thankfully, COVID did not put them out. It's over 600 jobs that have been created. In 2019 alone, we have helped three of our businesses open restaurants in the city, three black owned restaurants, um, sit down restaurants. That's incredible in a place like Boston, which is a very sad state on Boston. Um, but incredible for our businesses. We help businesses get into Whole Foods and our organization on its own has its own earned revenue that allows us to um, be able to continue to be as entrepreneurial as we are. And so that's just been in a, a, a thing we would not have anticipated when we started, which was that by having this infrastructure, having this incredible network of businesses, it would put us on, into a platform to be able to access in a lot of different directions in partnerships with one of our businesses just became the official uh, hot sauce for the Red Sox, for example. Like that would not have happened had we not had all of those other pieces in place. And so it's an incredible story from where we started with the idea of let's just do a shared kitchen in this old crappy, you know, meat factory in this dense low income neighborhood to this shining example of what you can do when you bring organizations together and resources together and government um, uh, working with a community around what it, what it means to do true economic opportunity, economic development, and economic mobility. So I'm excited about the direction we can go. I think there's a model here that is enormously replicable around the country, which we hope to um, 
demonstrate. Um, and with that, I am gonna, gonna cede my time to my friend Dave Quealy, who's gonna talk about some other amazing things that have been happening uh, up and down the Fairmont line. Thanks all. Thanks, um, thanks, Jen. Um, great presentation, and it made me more than a little bit hungry. So I'm gonna have to come visit the kitchen at some point soon. Um, so I'm Dave Queeley, uh, Director of Eco Innovation at Codman Square in DC. Um, <clears throat> and you know, this quote uh, makes me think about. Um, sorry, doing some housekeeping here. Um, <clears throat> Cities have the capability of providing for something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. And to me, it feels like most of the action, most of the excitement around sustainability and climate necessarily is happening in cities. And so that's obviously where we are working right now. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting it. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> um, so Codman Square, Gail referenced some of this, but you know, we've had a number of initiatives uh, and one of the initiatives is looking at the built environment and health. So we've got a long-term partnership with the Conservation Law Foundation. Um, it's a 10-year ten, ten longitudinal study. We're looking at health data and also empowering residents to go out into the community and collect that data. So we're still in the midst of that, but it's a, one of the long-term partnerships we've had going for a, a number of years now. <clears throat> um, we also, as Gail noted, have our oasis at Balu. It's our urban ag site. It's a former 20,000 square foot number of house lots that were connected. OASIS stands for Opportunity, Affirmation, Sustainability, Inspiration, and Success. Um, <clears throat> the residents in the area actually advocated for use of this site for urban agriculture. So we partnered with local residents. Um, it's providing healthy, hyper-local food to the community. Um, Codman Square is in somewhat of a food desert, um, and this site serves primarily people of color through a CSA, uh, winter farmers markets, summer farmers markets. We've also worked with reentry citizens and teaching them how to grow and sell food to residents and others, and it improves their interaction and engagement skills. It has a, um, also has a urban heat island effect by reducing urban heat island effect. If you're removing sidewalk and pavement and driveways and buildings, you're um, providing a reduction in urban heat island effect as well as a carbon offset, and as Gail noted, we produced almost 3,000 pounds of food in 2020. Um, the slide that Gail showed was probably a year before this, so you saw before it was just, just getting started, but this is probably a year later, and we were still growing in grow bags, and the site has become extraordinarily prolific, um, and now we have a brand new uh, hoop house there, which means we can grow year-round, continue to engage um, people at the site, um, we've got a number of volunteers, but it's uh, the site is also an opportunity for community engagement and <clears throat> excuse me, base building for our organization. So we're just starting to think about what that could look like. Um, and here is um, some tree planting we did at the site. These two young men who are working are were court involved, and we did a number of uh, plantings of trees a couple of years ago. So they learned how to become urban uh, horticulturalists, urban arborists in a way and planted some wonderful fruit trees on the site on this particular day. Um, Gail talked about the Fairmont Indigo Collaborative, so I won't talk too much about that, um, but I will focus on the third bullet, which is we're currently partnering on a Kresge Climate Change Health and Equity Grant. We got a one-year planning grant. As Gail noted, we now are in the middle of a three-year action grant. So we're really focusing our efforts on resident advocacy and empowerment and engagement and base building so that people can begin to speak for themselves about the issues that are of concern to them. Uh, we successfully advocated for the passage of the Climate Roadmap Bill, which the governor signed uh, a few months ago. Uh, HERO legislation is still in the works and we are advocating for um, the passage of that legislation, which doubles the deeds excise tax from $4 and something to $9 and something. So we generate money every year for affordable housing and open space. And then the third area of focus is creation of a Boston Conservation Corps. So we have successfully advocated so far for funding for that to be put in place. The city put up a million and the federal government has put up about 3 million. So 
Now the devil is in the details on both the Climate Roadmap and Conservation Corps um, bills. How will the $12 million that Gail mentioned um, get spent and who has a seat at the table and which ideas will come to the fore around job creation? Um, the same thing with the Conservation Corps, they're still figuring it out. So we're really trying to make ourselves be seen and heard as part of our advocacy and, and outreach efforts on these uh, three in these three buckets. So the TNT Eco Innovation District, um, we had four initial focus areas. The EID started um, around 2012 through efforts from LISC and the NRDC, but our focus initially was on energy efficiency. So how do you begin to get folks to take advantage of programs like Mass Save, which we're all paying into in Massachusetts as rate payers, um, how do you get them to take advantage of those programs and get some of the free, in some cases, energy efficiency upgrades to their homes, like getting new insulation in or air sealing or uh, light bulbs or just things that begin to save money right, right away. Um, second was democratizing solar power. The initial idea was to begin to um, make it easier for people to uh, get solar power put on their homes, whether that was a small business or a resident. So we've had some success there. We just had our first uh, resident get um, solar power put on their home. We helped out with a small uh, forgivable uh, grant um, and the forgiveness came when the person helped out with some of our initiatives in the community and it's turned out to be a great model. Uh, he's been great. And so he's done more than we ever expected. And so we're thinking about how we can continue that model. Um, on the small business side, we've talked to uh, one business owner who owns about a block of buildings in Cognitive Square. We're still talking, um, but that, that person's buildings are perfect for solar. So if we get it happening, I think others would uh, take it on. The, their roofs are flat with no trees and they're perfect for solar. And we also kind of undertook solar ourselves. So we. We um, you know, wanted to keep moving in this, in this space. We decided to put solar power on 16 of our buildings. And so that's lowered the cost for our organization, for those buildings and therefore for the tenants. Um, and of course, as Gail noted, we're continuing to green affordable housing. We're now building to a LEED silver standard. And we initially pursued LEED and D designation. LEED is leadership in energy and environment Design, environmental design for neighborhoods. So LEED ND is the US Green Building Council's rating system for neighborhoods. Um, we did go through the process of figuring out how to create a LEED um, designated piece of the Eco Innovation District. The original idea though was to use LEED ND as a lens <clears throat> through which all development um, in the neighborhood would happen. And, and we worked with neighbors on that idea, but it really became impractical in many ways. Lead ND is a checklist. And so even though we've gone all the way through the process, um, it's also an expensive process. So we haven't chosen to pull the trigger on the, uh, I think it's $18,000 that we'd have to pay to finish the designation. Um, so I just mentioned some of this, uh, NRDC and LISC had the initial concept. Um, the neighborhood, the TNT neighborhood, Talbot Norfolk Triangle neighborhood, had already established an interest in sustainability, but what we said was, what are the elements of sustainability that you care about? Um, and so really that led us to where we are now in some ways. Um, we had an initial project that included rain barrels for residents, which um, we got through a grant from LISC. <clears throat> and uh, there's some more projects coming that I'll talk about, but I wanted to give you a sense of where we are in Boston. So. Um, the key streets that bind or around the uh, Eco Innovation District, Washington Street, Talbot Ave, and Norfolk Street are heavily trafficked. Uh, Dorchester is the largest neighborhood in Boston. It's the most diverse, the most highest number of young people under the age of 18, um, probably the most ethnically diverse um, neighborhood in the city. And if it, were, if it were a city, it would be the fourth largest city in Massachusetts. Again, to provide you with more context, the white spot is the EID. To the left is Franklin Park and Olmstead Design Park. And down here, or up here in the upper right is uh, Boston's waterfront. So for us, the issues are not so much around climate and not so much around water and expensive real estate. We don't have that issue. For us, the issue is heat. And so for the people that we serve, heat is 
the climate, the existential and real climate threat that we face right now. And we're talking about, when we talk about the Eco Innovation District, we're talking about transforming a neighborhood from something like this to a more developed uh, area. Um, this is a piece of the Eco Innovation District. You'll notice there are no sidewalks, that there are light poles where the sidewalk should be. And on a, on a bad day, there are cars parked on both sides of the street. So the school buses you see in the distance really have a hard time getting down the street. So we're really trying to convert it from something like that to something that looks like this. These are designs that the neighborhood, um, initial designs the neighborhood did say that they liked. <clears throat> and just some other facts about um, the Eco Innovation District, 46 acres. It's about 270 homes right now. When I first started, it was probably around 240, but Codman Square has built a number of units of affordable housing and an affordable home ownership um, in the area. It's around probably 1,600 residents now. Um, but the telling fact is there are about 66% of the people live at or below the poverty line. The unemployment rate for young men of color is almost 50% in this sub neighborhood. And for our service area as a whole, we only have a 22% college graduation rate, which really led us to figure out, think about how can we help create jobs that don't require a four year degree. Uh, and that's where we're, that's where we've landed now in terms of our work on sustainability and um, and getting people certified. Now I'm gonna talk more about that, but I wanted to note that as Gail had a great slide of this and I, <laughs> I don't have one. Um, there are three green roofs on bus stops as part of the EPA Soak Up the Rain campaign. Uh, we did that about four years ago as a demonstration project. And the EPA has been very encouraging and supportive of our work ever since. But this That project really led us to where we are now in terms of working on green infrastructure and getting people certified. Just some more um, demographic information from our uh, uh, area, our zip code, which includes Codman Square. Um, people talk about climate change. They talk about it's coming, it's coming. Well, it, it's here. If you remember the heat waves we had this summer, if you remember the rains, the torrential rains we've had, I think in September, I don't remember a day it didn't rain. Um, so we're really dealing with climate change now. And in particular, there was a Washington Post um, article recently that jumped out at me that said the EPA just detailed all the ways climate change will hit US racial minorities the hardest. If the planet warms two degrees Celsius, black people are 40% more likely to live in places where extreme temperatures will cause more deaths. So that's right where we are and where we live and where we work. And we really wanna to try to make a difference around that. And if you look at this map from the city's climate ready Boston map explorer, uh, where the T in center is, that's where our office is. So and then the Eco Innovation District is kind of right down here. So you see we're right in the hottest, some of the hottest parts of Boston. And so the idea or the thought is that how can we begin to mitigate some of this heat um, and help people uh, reduce their urban heat island effect and not raise their prices. And so we've come up with a number of strategies. Um, we worked with the Nature Conservancy to do a uh, baseline tree study of all the trees that are in the Eco Innovation District. So this is Talbot Avenue, um, Norfolk Street, New England Avenue, and then this is the Fairmont line, the, the gas station, I'm sorry, the train station that uh, Yale mentioned is right here. And the bus stops were, uh, one was here and a couple were down the street near the Lee School. So we have some baseline data about trees in the neighborhood. They also looked at things like particulate matter. So if you look at the light blue and dark blue areas, those are areas darker is more particulate matter. And not surprisingly, they tend to coincide with areas that, are, that have fewer trees. So the darker red areas are areas that have less tree cover. And this is just a, a picture of our service area. So we also planted a number of trees a few years ago. We planted about 200 trees and shrubs, including about 25 in neighborhood yards in the Eco Innovation District. And so the two young men you saw on a previous slide did all of that in probably about a four week period, which was remarkable, including in neighborhood yards. So we had um, people who, we basically offered people the opportunity to have whatever kind of tree they wanted. So it could be ornamental, it could be a fruit tree. We had a lot of people 
who had come from other parts of the country, who had grown up with fruit trees. One woman said, you know, I had peach trees all over my yard when I was a, when I was a kid. I'd really like to have a peach tree. And so we were able to do that. And those trees are still to this day doing um, very well. And then what we did was measure the impact of these trees from a climate standpoint. So we, we took the trees and actually looked at things like carbon monoxide removal, stormwater removal, particulate matter removal, and put a, a dollar value to that. And we kind of tracked that tendency of individuals' trees to in, increase those benefits over time. So as you probably know, the older a tree, get, older a tree gets, the better it is at kind of taking up stormwater and improving air quality and pooling your house in the summer if it's on the south side of your house or keeping it warmer in the winter if it's on the north side of your house. So we try to put a number, quantify uh, those uh, elements. And then kind of zooming out a little bit on the Eco Innovation District, these are some of the developments that we have. So Codman Square has been lucky in that we owned about two thirds of the land, um, developable land in the Eco Innovation District. So that's allowed us to work very closely with neighbors on what kind of housing was gonna go there, what it would look like, what the green amenities would look like. So these are just a few of the, in, in light yellow, these are a few of the projects that are either in process or um, have, yeah, these have all actually been completed now. Um, and we're waiting for another project across the street, the street called Talbot Commons II to be completed. But the main area for where green infrastructure efforts were focused is on New England Avenue. In Codman Square, um, this area was chosen as the first slow streets neighborhood in the city of Boston. So slow streets neighborhoods are an opportunity to slow down traffic from the citywide limit of 25 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour, but they're also an opportunity to put in green infrastructure. So we were chosen as the first one in the city. They understood what we were trying to do. They saw the intersectionality of what we were working on from a health standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, um, and from a social justice standpoint. They undertook a um, study of the streets. Um, this is New England out here. The Fairmont line is right here. And you can see that the T station is right here. So again, a lot of our development means you don't have to have a car. You could literally get out of bed, walk across the street and take the train downtown in 12 minutes as opposed to an hour. Um, so they looked at kind of key issues and they looked at opportunities for green infrastructure. So one of the opportunities and for traffic coming, which encompasses that green infrastructure. So one of the opportunities was at this intersection, which is essentially a five-way intersection, but it had only one stop sign and people would speed through this intersection. So you'll see it in a minute, there's a diagram of a rain garden here and a rain garden here now and seven trees planted and another rain garden at the intersection of Mallard Avenue and Wimbledon. Avenue. So all of those things have come to fruition. And Slow streets includes things like curb extensions that make it safer for pedestrians. It includes rain gardens, as you see here, um, flex posts so that cars can't park right up to the edge of an intersection and make it difficult to see out, thereby increasing safety. And all of these things like um, curb extensions and bump outs actually allow you to put in green infrastructure. Hey, David? And again, David, this is Michael Bayer. I'm, we're going to stop the presentation here just to give us a little bit more time for Q&A. Uh, sorry to interrupt you that way. Uh, we're just look, looking at the time where we are since it's 3.20. Uh, we do want to get into the questions and we will be able to share your slide deck with the, yeah. uh, with the um, audience members here as well. And if folks do have any specific questions for you, uh, they'll be able to ask them both here and, and directly. So I apologize for having to to stop. I just wanted to make sure we had enough time for questions since we have received many. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask our panelists if they can go ahead and turn on their cameras. Um, and also, if you'll bear with us and possibly uh, stay an extra five to 10 minutes uh, with us so that we can uh, go through these questions as many as we can. We've gotten many great questions and we'll definitely share them as well as the comments that were that came in through the questions tab with the panelists. So uh, you all will have a chance to dialogue with them as well. You can see their contact information is up on the screen. So, so sorry to cut you off, but uh, we, we always enjoyed a opportunity to have the audience members uh, query you. So uh, to begin that, uh, a question and comment here from Kristen Grubbs, who's saying, 
Uh, the scale and scope of this project is so impressive. The funding, the number of partners, the breadth of impact, et cetera. This was with Gail when you were speaking. What do you think are the most important lessons you have learned that could be applicable to communities working on transit-oriented development on a much, much smaller scale? And also wondering if COVID has changed your goals or strategies in any permanent ways. So, yeah, I think uh, the lesson that I've learned from the work that we've done with is partnerships make a huge difference. <laughs> um, you know, coalescing with other people. And there were, as you, saw, as, as you saw, many, many people that were involved in this. And some of the original folks were a small grassroots organization called the Four Corners Action Coalition that started a lot of the transit equity work. But when we joined forces with them and the CDCs and turned out the residents and met, that that is, I think, even at a smaller scale, you know, the public will it, that you need to actually change and turn the needle in the direction that you want is important. So that's what I would say is the biggest lesson learned. Okay, and did COVID change any of that kind of thinking? And COVID, COVID, um, I would say that uh, COVID has definitely had um, caused us to, to some extent, pause a bit um, because of, you know, just the need to pivot to support folks in the community in ways that we hadn't before, you know, with food and emergency food uh, distribution, et cetera, things that we didn't do. Um, but I would say COVID definitely also helped uh, really educate us around um, the need for the climate justice work that we're doing, because in our community, as Dave mentioned, we have high, it's the highest rates of asthma, um, that, and, and also just food assets. So, I mean, those intersection of those issues of health issues and food issues that kind of really became more clear with COVID as people were struggling to, to make, to get enough money to eat, and then also struggling with the disproportionate impact of COVID in terms of mortality in our community, that the issues of climate are intersecting with that in the sense of how do we do the things that Dave talked about around the urban heat island effect that actually impacts smog and particulate matter, et cetera. So COVID paused us for a while, but didn't stop us and helped us kind of understand better the importance of some of the other work that we've branched out into the climate justice work. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question for David uh, from Lorraine Gonzalez, who asks, as part of the goals, I did not see avoidance of displacement uh, for businesses, and that was evident for housing, but not for businesses. Can you address um, business displacement in your neighborhood? Yeah, it's it's the TNT Eco Innovation District is mostly a residential neighborhood. I think there are probably three or four businesses and I know that at least one of them is in a building that we own. So um, we didn't see any, we aren't seeing displacement um, or green generated displacement, although that's been a concern. I actually had a resident walk up to me one day and said, so how do we make it nicer without making it too nice? So we get displaced. And that's that's an ongoing concern. That's a real, that's a real thing. Um, you know, I think Gail mentioned transit related displacement as we begin to get more transit in this neighborhood, people start to move in. There's, a, there's been some gentrification. And so, you know, what are the harbingers of gentrification that we should be paying attention to? So we're, we're looking at those, but so far, partly because we control a lot of the land in this eco-innovation district, that displacement issue hasn't happened. We've built a number of units of affordable rental and a number of units of affordable, recently uh, home ownership opportunity, 16 units of home ownership opportunity, all of it kind of, um, income um, limited. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another uh, question from Brian Hill. I think it may be for you, David, but uh, probably for everybody here. Um, a lot of organizations or policymakers will agree with the value of a project or program, but when it comes to allocating limited refunding, there never seems to be enough to go around. What strategies has your organization used to acquire committed local, state, or federal funding? Uh, I can I can start. I, I can tell you that we certainly look at all sorts of funding. You know, a lot of our projects um, 
involve state, local foundation funding, um, federal funding. So we're always looking at all sources. Um, I'll, I'll stop because I know Gail and Jen probably have more well, experience. Jen, if, if, if Jen has a perspective, I, I can share my perspective. She might have a perspective from Commonwealth Kitchen's perspective. Okay. So again, I think it goes back to um, organizing and advocacy and bringing uh, you know, the troops out <laughs> to actually push for what people need and want. And that is what happened. And also knowing how to work within the context of the system in terms of building relationships and partnerships with legislators and policymakers. I mean, I think we've taken a number of different angles. So we've got, we've done both. We've organized, you know, you know, hundreds of people to march on, you know, to fight for things. We didn't win certain things. Like I said, we didn't win the um, just cause eviction heat legislation at the city level. Um, but we did, you know, turn people out in droves for that. And then we also turned people out for the Community Preservation Act, which is now bringing tens of millions plus for affordable housing. So I think it's, it is, a, I go back to what I think is really fundamental is, is there's power in numbers. And so, you know, you got to get folks together, get your local or uh, community foundation and anyone who you think could be an ally to work with you, help support your work, help push and advocate for your work and educate people at the same time. I would just add one thing, Gail, which is the, the hallmark of the groups involved in the Fairmount work had built a lot of trust in each other. And so there wasn't that typical thing you would see in the nonprofit sector where, you know, Gail and the Codman Square team are are, are competing against the Dorchester Bay team or somebody else. There was a lot of conversation that happened around what happens when, how do we coordinate our efforts, and, and even where are the core competencies. And so you can see, you know, so Gail and David were talking a lot about the, the environmental justice work that they were doing. Well, I was working with Dorchester Bay Economic Development, and their title is Economic Development Organization. And so they were really trying to help lead on the economic development side. And so it was very intentional from the beginning and how the nonprofits got together and how they were gonna set themselves up to not be in competition, but to have the sum be much greater than its parts. And I think that's a very powerful part of why it's done what it's done. And I agree, one, one additional comment on that is, you know, we all had good track records too. I mean, we were credible entities that Folks could not say that we were, you know, slobs. We, we got it done in general and on the base work. And I think that helps build a lot of trust as well. And then on the, quickly back to the other question on the business displacement, we were concerned in the service area about that. And we had seen and saw some of that. Um, however, one of the things that we definitely have been doing in the Fairmount CDC Collaborative is this urban village model, which includes ground floor commercial space, not always, but most a lot of our projects. And those spaces are designed to be affordable to small businesses with an emphasis on BIPOC businesses. So that definitely is something we're paying attention to. Thank you, everyone. Next one here is from uh, Tonya Sanders, who says, Gail, your group has done amazing work. I'm absolutely taken aback by your success. Could you say more about the barriers you experienced in bringing these projects to fruition? Were there many any surprise naysayers and was there any backlash? Hmm, that's a good one. I mean, there's always challenges and barriers, they abound, and I'm sure they are no different than uh, what, what other folks experience. Uh, first of all, I feel like we could have and should have done a lot more than what we've done, so thank you for the, for the compliment, but there's always a lot more to do. In terms of the barriers, um, I think in naysayers, I'll start with the naysayers. The naysayers were um, so, interestingly enough, sometimes our own constituents, the low income people that we were working with, part of it was, and an example is, and, 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 and I think we've kind of converted hearts and minds on this, but, you know, in Mattapan, um, we, there was a very strong, uh, they have a higher rate of, of BIPOC homeownership, one of the few neighborhoods in, in Boston that has a relatively high rate of BIPOC homeownership, and the Fairmount Line station that was proposed to go into Mattapan was literally right at the end of a, of a very well-organized street uh, that a former uh, zoning commission uh, leader uh, had lived on and his widow still lived on. And they were adamantly, uh, and these are 
people of color, but they were adamantly that that neighborhood association had a lot of political clout because of you know their historical kind of work and 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 who was involved in their in their neighbor association. Little a lot of political clout. They were adamantly against you know the siding of the station uh, because they felt it was going to de de uh, de you know kind of erode their quality of life by having a station next to their their housing, their their home ownership housing. Also had and they they did come around. There was you know a lot of other folks who were you know, not homeowners uh, who wanted the station and some homeowners who did. And so as a result of kind of organizing folks and having everybody's voices heard, including the, the neighborhood association, the homeowners, um, there was, the station did finally get, get installed, but the, it took probably three years longer than it was planned to because of that kind of opposition. We also had folks who were concerned about doing any transit-oriented development because they were concerned about, well, this is not going to be for me. You're doing this for someone else. And I didn't understand that comment until within the last three or three to five years. And I start seeing the gentrification and displacement that has popped up just really quickly as a result of these additional, and there are other factors, economic factors that have led to the, the rapid gentrification of our service area, but the transit is definitely one of them. And so I can see now where people were, were doubtful about is this really for me or are you really doing this additional work uh, in terms of these transit stations for others? And, and there were other barriers that had to do with the uh, politicians and policymakers, but the additional work that, that we kept at it, the, our credibility in terms of getting things done, I think helped overcome that and the relationship building and collaboration helped with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here is for Jen from Ann Carroll who says, are there space requirements for commercial kitchens you think are essential? Wouldn't, wouldn't an abandoned storefront work or a combined storefronts? I'd be interested in seeing what other Brownfields configurations can support these redevelopments. Mm, that's a good question. Um, so so there's, a, there's a lot to unpack in that. So, so like shared kitchens, um, the rules on shared kitchens from health department vary from city to city. City of Boston is incredibly scared of them because imagine I'm the vegan baker and I'm working next to Dave and Dave's, you know, working with raw chicken and how does his raw chicken not get in my vegan baked goods, right? So there's a lot of complications if you want to do this that you'll want to think about in terms of your local, your local um, uh, permitting authorities. In terms of the physical space, like for a retail space, the challenge when you get into any kind of multiple businesses and food in particular is how much storage they need. So generally speaking, a simple mat, piece of math is for every kind of business and kitchen that you have, you need probably three times as much storage. So we actually are in our building and we lease half of the building we're in, We've at, we're out of space, not because our kitchens are maxed, because our storage is maxed. So as you think about it, you also want to think about like, from a retail perspective, where are these businesses selling their food? So if you have a brownfield site and it's not a particularly good retail site in general, there's not good foot traffic or driving traffic or whatever it might be, can it be that sort of home base for food trucks or caterers? So you want to think about it from the perspective of the operation, not so much from the capital side of well, what could we do with it, but really how is a business owner going to come in there and use it for something that they can actually make money. So I don't know if that helped answer that question exactly, but it, it, certainly thinking about, and we're doing a lot more of putting retail or putting our businesses into retail spaces now, just like that example I gave of what we're doing with MIT. We actually are about to open right on the Fairmount line. One of our companies, Fresh Food Generation, is getting ready to open their first sit down restaurant. It is a block from the Talbot Ave um, Fairmount rail line. That's a beautiful, um, circular back all the way around from how they started with us with no idea of what they were doing to building a food truck, building a catering business, and now building their first brick and mortar. So, so it depends. That's my very unsatisfying answer. Okay, thanks, Jen. I guess another question along those lines here is from Colin Bratton, who says, some huge proportion of Massachusetts farmers are over the age of 60, and the majority have no secession plan. The uh, number of independent farms in the state is declining, particularly in suburban areas near the city. Are you aware of any work that has been done to connect burgeoning urban agricultural programs around the state with more traditional farms as a way to sustain agriculture around the Commonwealth? 
Um, yes, there is a fair amount that's happening on the from the farmer side that we are less involved in, but there are groups like New Entry Sustainable Farming, which is part of Tufts University. Their work is really helping teach farming to new farmers, a lot of immigrant farmers. And some of that work is actually looking at, well, where is their farmland and where is their opportunities to connect back into the farmers? Um, the cooperative extension at UMass Amherst is doing some of that work. Certainly not enough. We all know that, you know, food, food businesses don't typically, especially in the farming world, they don't get the kind of resources that they need to continue to do this work. So there's certainly more that can be done. Some of our work is really helping try to connect those dots. So the more you can create the economic opportunity to work for farmers, the more the rest of the pieces can fit together. But there are certainly organizations, intermediaries, the Carrot Project is another one that comes to mind, that are specifically focused on working with the farming community. But it's a great, it's a great comment. Yeah, it is. And from an urban ag perspective with Cobman and, and our Balu Urban Ag uh, Project, it's good to know. I'll be talking more to Jen about all these things. But um, but, uh, you know, we have just been so focused on trying to just, keep the, you know, get the, um, the site into a kind of break even point, you know, that we have not yet kind of explored the, that very good question and very need, much needed kind of piece of work of, of connecting, you know, with some of the urban suburban retiring and burgeoning new urban ag sites, but great, great concept and something we'll look into. Okay, thank you both. I'm just going to ask a couple more questions and thanks for being over a little bit. We still have uh, more than 400 people with us right now. Um, next comment and question here is from Son Sonia Brihi who says, uh, displacement and just gentrification is such an issue with transit investments like this. I'm working on these issues in Northern Virginia and trying to understand the types of tools that can help combat this. Can you talk a bit uh, more about residential tax where a portion goes to affordable housing. It seems this might put added financial stress on lower income individuals who are trying to stay in their neighborhood. Did the community support this initiative and was anything in, built into the tax to protect lower income individuals? Okay, I think you're talking about the Community, uh, community Preservation Act, which raised the, um, the real estate taxes um, slightly. Uh, first of all, uh, it was, a, there was, a, I believe, a referendum on that that the um, city of Boston residents were able to weigh in on. And the city of Boston, as I recall, Jen, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I, know there, I think there was a referendum on this. And the city of Boston residents did agree that they wanted to do this. And, um, it, and as it turns out, the um, increase has not been significant. It's, you know, depends on, I guess, where you sit in terms of your income, but it, it, has, it, it has generally not been, you know, hundreds of dollars, you know, it's been, you know, probably a little less than, than two, uh, in some cases, $50 or so more per year. Um, and no, there is no, there are no kind of, you know, affordability um, waivers, as far as I'm aware for it, for the CPA. Um, however, the Boston, like, like, I guess many localities does have a, um, residential exemption that, you know, if you live in your housing uh, and you can apply for, meaning if you live and own and live in the housing and it's a certain size, you can apply for it. And then also they have a senior elder exemption on the real estate tax side. So, so far there has not been a hue and cry. This has been in place now for about three years, I want to say, uh, roughly. Uh, and is generating, I can't remember the figure, but I think it's, you know, no, probably no less than, than million dollars. I don't remember the exact figure per year for our work. Um, so no, there haven't been no waivers, but it's, it's so far has been very well accepted and taken up. Okay, thank you. A couple more here. Um, this one is from Robert Hibbert who says, have any transit related land value increases been captured to to use for the purpose of supporting the local community. These funds can be tapped to help the community and avoid, and avoid displacement. We also definitely need to expand this amazing economic development story, the support of, of local small business. No, not, that has not happened that I'm aware of, no. I'd love to learn more from, is it Robert on that? So send me an email, but uh, no, that, that I'm not familiar. And we have no, it sounds like kind of almost like tax increment financing or something along those lines, but I'm not 
familiar with that and no we have not done that. yeah i mean certainly certainly the city of boston as part of this has been using cdbg money they've been using some of their inclusionary zoning money to create low interest loan products so some of them have been for homeowners to help keep them in their homes and the right so they're finding ways to try to work around the edges um and similarly they some of that money has gone into commercial commercial is always a challenge because the people who know housing think they know commercial but they don't as somebody who is a had done affordable housing for a long time i can tell you it is completely different except that it's a physical building the the economic reality the financing models the the underwriting it's all very different and i think that's and, and i so i think that there's a challenge of getting everybody in the system whether it's the government or the nonprofits and the businesses themselves for sure to understand how the tools to do it um having said that what you see in the commercial side again sort of like the housing is there's can be resources low interest loans a little bit of grant money on the commercial side for like signs and storefront improvements um almost always for capital and so the challenge especially in the communities we all care about and work in is that you're talking about business owners that are already undercapitalized without friends and family resources credit collateral guarantee don't have it so what do you do to help them finance the things that are not financeable because there's a piece of real estate or a piece of equipment or a house or a building or a car and i think that continues to be a challenge that we all have to find our way around and certainly there's a lot of cdfis trying to do this my experience is, is that they are um mediocre at best and so there's more to do on the on trying to get those solutions solved around true economic opportunity that is really leading to wealth creation and not just more ways to extract resources out of our communities Okay, thank you. Just a couple more here. Uh, we actually got a few questions about the green roofs and the bus shelters and how they're being maintained and how that maintenance is being paid for. Does anybody know on the panel? Uh, that's a that's actually a, a great question. We were only able to, um, so we worked with the city of Boston and um, an advertising company who put ads on those bus shelters to get us to, we'll just get it, just to be able to put them on in the first place. But the city was concerned about what would happen with the weight uh, in the winter time once it got snow on them. So the frameworks are still up there, but we did take out the plants. The plants were just mats of sedums, which are only about three inches thick. So I'm not sure what the weight issue was, but anyway, we would still love to find funding to put them back um, at least seasonally uh, and, and get them back in there. So, but we haven't we haven't been able to do that yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one here is, uh, as you mentioned, with the success of the TOD and providing affordable housing, rents and housing prices are rising. What are the potential strategies that you and the communities are thinking about to address these challenges? Yeah, well, we, we I talked about some of that in, in terms of the legislative and policy uh, advocacy pieces that we're working on. So, you know, we are working uh, at the state level, and this is where the intersection of climate and housing come together to organize the climate justice group that that we've developed that we've uh, developed through various funding sources to actually advocate for the uh, housing housing um, what is it called E I forgot what it stands for Housing and uh, Environment Resource Opportunity Act, and that is a uh, a Pot of funds that, that through the raising of the deeds excise tax um, to raise $300 million a year, a half of which will go into climate mitigation um, efforts and the other half of which will go into affordable housing. So trying to develop more pots of money and more resources to fund affordable housing development is one strategy through um, that we have in mobilizing the folks that are most impacted to advocate for those strategies. And then we also uh, have been advocating for a couple of years in different ways and different forms for this Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, which would facilitate uh, and require that tenants of multifamily buildings have first opportunity to purchase their first right of refusal to purchase their, um, their, their buildings. And you know, bringing that type of, uh, you know, legislation to bear and, and, and bringing the, this, the community development and responsible developers uh, in touch and, and to, to partner with those, those uh, tenant groups 
to do that. So those are just some ways, just mainly through kind of developing our, our the troops to push for the policies that make sense in terms of helping to prevent displacement and to build more affordable housing. But we don't we don't pretend to have the ultimate answer. It's a big challenge. Great, thank you very much. So I think we'll go ahead and, and uh, start to close. And I just wanted to give everybody, I guess, a minute or so to give us some kind of final takeaways um, for um, what we've heard today. A lot of great information, uh, great questions as well. I guess maybe we'll go ahead and, and go in the reverse order of speakers and uh, start with you, David, if you may. Um, well, I. I didn't get through all my slides, obviously, but if people have questions about them, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I think, you know, the one of the main points I wanted to make was that this work has now landed us in a place where we are trying to get people certified in what we think is going to be a burgeoning field in green infrastructure um, and getting them sort of jobs as well. So we're, we're going to continue that work and think this has all been, that's kind of a logical outcome of all the work that we've done over the past few years. So, um, But I'm happy to talk to people uh, offline after this. Yeah, I, I would say that um, what I so appreciate about what Gail and team are doing is they're not afraid of the complexity. And that is unusual, right? <clears throat> we all are used to working in work that is very transactional. I got my deal or my thing, and that's what I'm working on. and this this kind of systems change there's a reason it's interactive it, it's been intractable historically and it's because everything is siloed all the way up to the government and so what the smart growth work did was to actually start to break those silos down what you see happening even this panel and the expertise of the three of us it's all very different and us being aligned is incredibly powerful and when we can start to bring in our case bring colleges and hospitals into this as well that's when the change happens that is very challenging to do to maintain that even harder to fund so getting funders to look at this and understand gail you're doing too many things what the heck are you doing right like the minute we can get people to understand but look at what the sum of its parts does that's when things get really exciting and interesting and just like the thing i keep saying to everybody is change happens at the speed of trust don't have trust whether it's with the community whether it's with your partners or it's not going to happen you gotta have values alignment, you gotta have trust. So, but I'm hopeful by seeing this great work that's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think Jen said a lot of what I would say. I think um, my parting words are stay courageous, to be courageous, be tenacious, <clears throat> find allies and partners, um, do what you do well so that you are um, a trusted, you know, reliable, you know, uh, so when you start rabble rousing you <laughs> people can see that you already have done what you do well and that that perhaps you could do more well with the right resources and support but find your allies find partners be tenacious be courageous and just keep plugging away at it that's that's my parting words great thank you and thank you all with that we're going to go ahead and conclude our webinar today uh, local strategies for equitable and sustainable transit oriented development i'd love to like to offer a great big thank you to all our panelists for a great presentation to everyone who attended today and to john coleman our communications and technology guru who helps to make this all happen the complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org also for those of you who have requested one all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation please look for this follow-up email especially if you need that to claim other continuing education credits when you exit from today's webinar you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you and finally keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars you can see we're continuing our uh, walktober series with the maryland department of transportation with two sessions coming up one tomorrow on pedestrian safety trends measures and solutions and one next thursday great partners and creative approaches for promoting safe walk opportunities which will be Thursday, October 28th at 10.30 Eastern. The next webinar in this series right now is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, December 1st at 2 p.m. More information on this will be sent out soon. So with that, I wish everybody a great day.